Okay, so uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Duncan. He's very gracious to have joined us. Just for those of you who are here today, so you know, we will have several members of, of his department. Uh, also Anwar Sheikh, uh, Sanjay Reddy, uh, Ying, uh, Ying Chen, I think that's, that's the other three. So economic, given the topic, is well represented. And of course, you could not do this at some other school very easily. Maybe you of Mass and Amherst, you could do it. Here it would be hard to do because, I mean, elsewhere it would be hard to do simply because there would not be enough people who have much to say on this, on this topic. It was different in 1920, about which you'll say something today, when I think people on both sides were interested in the socialism, both sides, in lots of sides, interested in the socialism problem. Anyhow, Duncan, thank you very much for doing this and, uh, and welcome. Well, thank you, uh, Andrew, and thank you for taking all the trouble to put together this uh, great series that uh, looks like a very, very interesting and sort of path-breaking uh, effort to focus discussion on just what socialism might be. It's really apropos to me because we're at a point where m many more people, say in the United States, voters, especially young, young voters, seem to identify themselves uh, as socialists in one version or another. And um, this has always made me a little nervous um, because I wonder exactly what they think they mean by calling themselves socialists and whether and how much they really um, the, how much understanding they have of the very um, complex and uh, uh, complex and uh, history of socialism um, so that uh, which I, I think if you're going to go into a political position, it's very, it's better to have, a, you're never going to be able to know what happens politically in the industry, but it, it doesn't hurt to have a little knowledge of what kind of horrible mistakes people made before you and just how badly things could work out and stuff like that, um, even when people go into it with great good intentions. Um, this uh, talk was one of two talks. I guess you have both of them uh, available. If you don't, I can make the other one. I had one. I'd love to see Vienna it. to uh, San uh, But I, I like prepared I'm in 2011. Um, Eric Olin Wright, who was a, a Marxist sociologist uh, and taught at the University of Wisconsin up to the time of his death about a year and a half ago. Um, uh, ran a, uh, an institute called the Havens Institute, which funded uh, a lot of research and especially graduate students working on political economy topics from socio sociological point of view. Um, and they, asked, they decided actually ahead, even of Andrew, to have a whole symposium on socialism and invited people including myself from all over the country to give, come and give a talk. I got to be in Madison, Wisconsin for a whole week of um, this, this very pleasant and um, uh, very interesting to talk to our students. So the two talks uh, I divided roughly up historically. This one, uh, they were called Socialist Alternatives to Capitalism, and this one I said was Marx to Hayek, with the idea of trying to cover uh, to some degree what was going on with socialism from Marx's lifetime, let's say the 1840s when Marx was a pretty young man, to, to the socialist calculation debate of the late 1930s, and that's why Hayek comes in as the other goalpost in the, in the scope description. Uh, the other one is called uh, Vienna to Santa Fe, and it goes back a little bit before the 1930s to the 1920s and tries to look at uh, the impact of the mathematics of the optimal control theory and cybernetics and uh, game theory on ideas of socialism uh, and the 
transformation the idea of socialism from what I'll call a top-down conception, which was dominant in this first period, to a bottom-up conception that was influenced very heavily by complex systems theory. And uh, I imagine we'll have some time to talk over those ideas since I'll introduce them. Um, so uh, the paper starts off by pointing out that there's a, a long, long history of people trying to figure out the, the good life. I mean, Plato's Republic starts off with Socrates uh, trying to answer what is the good life and coming up with the idea that you can't talk about the good life except talk about the society in which somebody lives the good life. Um, whether Plato got on the right track, Plato was a pretty top-down guy, I would say, in his own way. Um, but um, anyway, this goes back a long time. But where, where, the, where socialism, in my view, starts to sizzle, as it were, or get to be a big um, political economic issue, uh, was uh, in the late 18th century um, and after the French Revolution uh, for a couple of uh, reasons. One is that the Industrial Revolution, it became clear in the late 18th century, especially in England, um, it's really amazing to me how much people were able to see ahead. I mean, eight, 18th century levels of labor productivity and income were very low compared to anything in the 20th century of the advanced capitalist countries. But they uh, clearly understood that the unleashing of mechanical power, uh, hydropower, coal, uh, steam, was going to transform, make an order of magnitude a bigger transformation in the productivity of labor. And that raised the question of what human beings were going to do with this newfound wealth of ability to produce the needs of life, food, clothing, housing, and all, all of those things. Um, uh, the, um, at the same time, uh, of course, there were tremendous political changes due to the collapse of the Ancien Regime, the French Revolution, and its associated uh, changes. Um, and uh, I generally, in uh, Adam's fallacy, um, try to start the story with the clash between people like William Godwin, who was a perfectibilist and argued that uh, given these very high uh, levels of labor productivity, you could solve social problems. Right? Actually, you hear Godwin type stuff now, right? I mean, there's this whole idea that roboticization is going to just transform the social relations of production, um, which I don't personally buy into, but um, it's an exciting idea. And people can get uh, very excited about it. And the perfect of, so his, so Godwin kept saying, well, now that we have this ability to make life uh, better for people, we're going to make life better for people. And that predictably ran into a uh, reaction from people like Thomas Malthus, who said, well, hold your horses, because all that's going to happen when you increase incomes is that you're going to uh, unleash a population explosion that's going to erode the basis of the income per capita right back down to the point where uh, mortality and fertility are, are in balance. So these arguments, which we can see um, echoes of all over the place in our own society, um, come come up are really quite old and, and go back to this uh, most to this uh, period. Um, at the same, so in the early 19th century, there were radical movements of political reform. Um, a lot of this, in my view, is connected with the middle class. So people who are most interested in things like socialism were actually the middle class, not particularly the working class, and particularly and not particularly landowning elite or even the nascent uh, capitalist class. Um, but the middle classes were, did start to feel restless with 
things like inequality, extreme inequality of distribution of income that capitalist social relations produces, and um, started to have a whole range of movements for universal extension of civil and political rights, um, reform of corrupt national political systems, uh, free trade, republican forms of national political organization, and uh, so forth. Uh, and among this whole spectrum of reform, uh, ideas of reforming society and making it better, um, were a group of uh, ideas about social, socialist principles, which basically had the idea that there should be better equality in the distribution of income. And most of the socialists, early socialists, um, had the insight that the distribution of income is unequal because of the organization of production. So it wasn't just Marx who had that idea, but a lot of people had that idea. Um, and uh, this led, for example, to a bunch of small-scale experiments of utopian socialism of uh, people like Owen and uh, Fourier and uh, so forth, where people would actually form, and in the United States, this was, this was quite a big movement in the pre-Civil War period, where people would actually um, try to gather together and form an intention, what we now call an intentional community around uh, organizing production in a different way. Now, of course, the United States, uh, the early United States, had a huge amount of agricultural land that was very fertile, and so everybody was basically farming, and it was not such a big step to change the farming pattern to a collective or a communal uh, form. Some of these um, efforts um, have lasted quite a long time, and they have very interesting histories, which you might want to look into. I don't know, or maybe you're even having somebody talk about them in this uh, set of lectures. Um, now, I would say neither the theoretical nor the experimental side of this kind of socialism, utopian socialism, or uh, Marx tends to call it. <laughs> If only Marx were a candidate for the uh, Democratic nomination for president, then you'd see exactly what was wrong with the other candidates. Um, anyway, he was very good at figuring out what was wrong with other people's socialism. Um, uh, but n none of these really uh, achieved much of a foothold as a, as a ba basic social movement, especially compared to the force of capitalist accumulation, which fostered proletarianization, urbanization, globalization on a world scale, and as we know, transformed uh, society um, for better or worse in its own image <coughs> in ways that were not particularly socialist. Um, in my reading, uh, Marx's thought, Marx's political thought really stems from the notion that there was unfinished business in the French Revolution. French Revolution enunciated a, um, an ideal of a kind of human, uh, of all human beings sharing in society in a kind of equal way, both politically and economically. And the French Revolution made some progress on the political end of this in uh, destroying the Ancien Regime and the, and the feudal uh, remnants of feudalism and aristocracy, um, or in completely destroy them, um, but um, by and large got stuck on that in terms of economics. So the, the economics of the French Revolution was largely what uh, Marx calls bourgeois economics. So it was trying to find a form of government, which actually the French had a really hard time doing, that one could argue they never have done it, actually, right to the present time. Uh, that could uh, meld together the political uh, ideals of the French Revolution and also be an effective uh, context for capitalist uh, production. Um, so Marx uh, starts in the 1840s. Now that's already 40 years or 30 years after the, the French Revolution um, uh, to uh, with a very specific political goal, 
And I think it's hard to understand Marx unless you understand his political idea, um, which in my view is less, much less persuasive than his economic analysis um, for reasons which I'll try to explain. But um, what uh, Marx, Marx's big epiphany or um, idea, vision, uh, in Schumpeterian terms, was that he was going to persuade the European, first of all, he believed that the European proletariat had a huge role to play politically in the future of European history in the 19th and 20th century. And in that, he was clearly correct. Um, because the later uh, history was uh, a history uh, in which working class parties and uh, proletarian <coughs> movements played an enormous uh, role. Uh, but Marx wasn't content with that. He also uh, wanted to persuade the European proletariat that its issue should be a change in the class control of social surplus uh, product. In other words, that what the, the content of proletarian politics should have as a big chunk of it should be this program of transforming the, what Marx called the relations of production. Uh, in such a way that uh, the proletariat would control the surplus product um, itself. Um, the, um, and Marx viewed his revolutionary communism as being grounded in a hard-headed, realistic analysis of European politics and society. So he wasn't saying, well, people are basically good, and now that we, uh, in a Godwin way, now that we have high levels of labor productivity, it frees people up to be the good people that they really are inside and all that. This is not the kind of thing that Marx uh, went for much at all. But he said, well, okay, concretely, the proletariat is a real social class, and it's there. You can see it. You just have to walk around the European city, and you're going to uh, realize this. Um, and the question is, what is their political role going to be? Um, the idea being that initially they would get control of the surplus product as a class, that's in the particular Gotha program, but in the longer run, um, having some goal of ending exploitative relations of production altogether. Um, but there's some I think there are a couple of problems with Marx's thinking in this respect, uh, which we may want to talk about a little bit. Um, despite the, Marx is a genius, and he has tremendous insights into um, the reality of social life that uh, I think one ignores at one's peril. But it's not so obvious to me that social control over production is necessarily the economic content of working class political. In fact, there's uh, been a contrary position of working class political movements that the working class doesn't want to control production. What they want is a bigger share of the social product. Um, and these, there's the tension between these two points of view played a big role in um, uh, Marx's development of his own thinking. Um, nor does it seem that there's anything in the logic of classical political economy, which is where Marx took his analysis of class relations of capitalism, uh, that uh, points to the transcendence of private property as the keystone of economic organization? The, a lot of the rest of it is there in Ricardo and Smith. They understood the class divisions of capitalist society uh, very vividly. But uh, it's only Marx who tries to push this to the idea that there's going to be a transcendence of property uh, relations. Um, so you can read what I have to say about this in chapter three of um, uh, Adam's Fallacy. But um, uh, let's turn a, a little bit more towards how this political dilemma of Marx's which is that he was, had basically uh, 
an unpopular position within the European working class movement. So he was fighting for leadership of the, what he, of the European working class movement, but probably from a minority position, probably from a position that was not where most workers, for one thing, it was very hard to understand Marx. Um, you know, many workers probably sympathized with his rhetoric and stuff like that, but how many people really understood the ins and outs of the labor theory of value and uh, all of those things. Um, so a lot of Marx's um, thinking on political economy, in my view, um, really uh, was an attempt to respond to this dilemma that he found himself, this existential dilemma he found himself in. Uh, politically. He faced a range of committed and credible working class political leaders whose economics programs fell far short of Marx's vision of epochal change. So for example, a lot of people said, well, we're going to still have money and we're going to have commodities, we're just not going to have exploitation. So well, somehow the workers will get the whole fruits of their labor and control the whole fruits of their labor. Um, uh, other uh, very uh, persuasive political positions were based on the idea of workers' control, that you might ha have a change in the control of production, but it would be still basically a bunch of enter competing enterprises, just not run by capitalists, instead run by uh, workers. Um, Marx, though, really stuck it out that he wanted to get rid of the commodity, he wanted to get rid of money, he wanted to get rid of the whole system of organization of production that was based on uh, those forms. So in that sense, he was, he was very uh, radical. Um, a key text here, if you're interested in this, is uh, the chapter on money in the Grundrisse of Marx. Immensely long, really not so easy to read, but if you want to get an idea of, where, of how Marx was trying to work this through. And this is one of these things that's Marx writing for himself, right? So it's full of stuff like, but then we might say, and all the stuff that I've tried to persuade my students to get rid of in their thesis drafts. Um, um, but he, um, he particularly was focused on the idea of the Ricardian socialists who were Ricardian people who adopted Ricardo's theory of economics, which in some ways is rather similar to Marx. And it's a labor theory of value, and it focuses on a division, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a contended division between wages and profits in national income. But uh, what Bray, Bray and Gray, the Ricardian socialists, argued was that the problem there could be solved by changing money. Um, so if you look at what Ricardo, if you look at Ricardo's version of labor theory of value, he argues that competition um, tends to force natural prices, long-term average prices of uh, commodities around which market prices fluctuate, which is a key idea for the classical political economists, to be proportional to the labor time required for the production of commodities, which Marx agreed with on average over the whole system, but not uh, in detail, sector by sector. Thus, commodity exchange boils down on average to an exchange of labor time for labor time, and Marx often talks this way himself. Um, so if, uh, like Ricardo, you regard money as a veil, it's just uh, a uh, fiction, as it were, um, and the reality behind it is this uh, exchange of labor times to labor time, then you don't see why, but then it looks like the big problem is the capitalists are getting a cut somewhere in here in this exchange of labor time against labor time. And if you could get rid of that, then you would get rid of the exploitation part of the system, but the rest of it would still operate. Um, uh, so they uh, proposed a system of labor certificates, um, which would be to replace money. So the idea is you go to work and you get paid, but instead of getting paid with Federal Reserve notes or deposits at a bank, you would get paid with these labor certificates, 
and the amount you would get paid would be proportional to the amount of labor time you put in, maybe adjusted for your skill and uh, training, things like this. When you get into this level, it's very complicated. Um, but um, in, in theory, then the system ought to work out all right because those labor certificates ought to be just enough to buy back the product that everybody produced in the division of labor. But because you got paid for the whole of your labor time, the workers got paid for the whole of their labor time, there wouldn't be any surplus value and there wouldn't be any uh, exploitation. Well, Marx, um, Marx did not uh, believe in this kind of thing. And it's interesting to see what he, and I think it gives you some insight into what Marx thought the theory of value was. He thought the theory of value was primarily an analytical tool that could help you ferret out fallacies and arguments exactly like this. And that's really what you see him working through in this uh, chapter on money and stuff, uh, where he makes the observation that under capitalist relations of, private, of production, private labor becomes social labor only through the exchange of products as commodities. So the fallacy of the labor certificate scheme lies in its implicit assertion that private labor could be made immediately social, which raises the question, how do you know it was social labor that the worker um, you know, punched the time clock for? Uh, you were going to give them the labor certificate, but well, they didn't do anything, so they goofed off or um, something of that kind. Um, so um, from this point of view, Marx's um, thinking uh, raises some very fundamental questions that are still fresh, which is if you're going to have socialism, I guess you do have to have some way to make private labor social labor, or the labor has to be social to begin with. Marx said, well, the only way that that could really happen would be if the bank that issued these labor certificates actually ran the production process itself in detail. So it would be a kind of big central planning organization, not just a uh, way to decentralize and avoid uh, exploitation. Um, so he argued that from the labor theory of value that commodity exchange equalizes labor times of different workers only on average over repeated cycles of production, which would be a problem for the labor certificate problem, uh, scheme. Uh, a second point is that the social character of privately expended labor has to be proved through the realization of the value of the produced commodity through its exchange for money. So you can't really get rid of money and still uh, have a commodity uh, process of uh, socialization, uh, of transformation of private labor to social labor. And uh, the third point, which turns out to be quite important in the 20th century, is that the capitalist extracts labor from labor power. The capitalist pays the money wage for labor power, which may be wasted or ineffectual in the production process, which underlies the fact that the wage labor contract is not a share contract. We talk about the wage share in national income, and it makes it seem as though wages, what's going on is that we produce and labor gets one share and capitalists get another share. That's a very, very uh, potentially misleading way of thinking about what happens in capitalist production because it suggests that uh, capitalist production is really share based on a sharecropping kind of contract, which it, in fact it is not. The capitalist pays the wage whether or not the uh, product gets sold on the market. Um, okay. Um, I have some stuff in here, maybe we can talk about this in the discussion about uh, a little bit more about Marx's um, labor theory, Marx's theory of value as an extension of the long period um, method of um, Smith and Ricardo. Um, but uh, I'm going to skip that because I don't want to take too long. <laughs> 
presentation. Um, I do want to spend just a minute on Marx's concept of socialism. Um, the main, oh, before we pass from this thing about the labor code theory of value and commodity production, if you're really interested in this, by f a, a very, very important text is the thing called Essays on Marx's Theory of Value by Isaac Illich Rubin. Uh, Rubin was clearly the best, in my view, the best reader of Marx, who wrote in the 1920s in the Soviet Union. Um, and so if you really, it's a good starting point getting an idea about these things. Um, for socialism, we have to start with the critique of the Gotha program, which is this commentary Marx wrote in 1875 on a draft program for a revived unified workers' movement in the form of the German Social Democratic Party. Um, now, in general, uh, Marx um, response to questions about how you're going to organize social society by ducking, which I think is a big problem, but maybe makes some sense. In other words, he would say things like, those questions could be solved only by those who actually confronted them historically. So you have to have the revolution, make the revolution, and then you're going to be uh, able to uh, figure out what you're going to do next. This, I really think, had a bad result in the 20th century. If you look at both the Russian Revolution and the Chinese Revolution, where the jury is still out, the historical jury is still out. Um, but anyway, in the critique of the Gotha program, Marx envisions two stages to the construction of communism. Um, in the first stage, looks very much like capitalism in that the workers don't get the whole fruits of their labor. Uh, they only get a, a chunk of it as their actual compensation. And the rest of it is taken uh, for to finance stuff like investment, education, health, welfare, uh, and defense, presumably, although Marx doesn't uh, mention this part of it. Um, that is exactly the things that are financed out of surplus value in capitalist society. The main difference seems to be that uh, in capitalist society, the surplus product is appropriated by the capitalist and landowning classes in the form of surplus value, while in the first stage of socialist society, the surplus product is appropriated through some political mechanism, maybe the dictatorship of the proletariat, for example. Um, Marx does not explicitly discuss the social organization of production, but we might infer that the way it works is the workers go to jobs uh, in enterprises, get paid in the form of money, well, not labor certificates, but money, and buy products with these money revenues, but the, and get exploited just like they, but what they're doing is exploiting themselves because they're supposed to be in control of the political mechanism that uh, appropriates the surplus value. Um, one thing that you notice in this, or at least I notice in this, is that although Marx obsessed on this question of the bottom-up organization of commodity production, which is the big theme of Smith and Ricardo, um, that it's a spontaneous uh, kind of organization which only is achieved ex post through contradictory um, turmoil and, and so forth. He never translates that into its social, a socialist equivalent. So the, the picture you get of socialism is that it's going to work more like a military system. The, you know, somebody's going to be at the top. Maybe the people at the top are going to be democratically elected by the proletariat, but um, nonetheless, the actual organization of production is going to be top down in this, um, in this question. Um, any thoughts that Marx might have had some version of decentralized, spontaneous organization of production in mind as a basis for socialism run into his unambiguously ne negative comments on commodity production. 
and money as backward, anarchic, irrational, contradictory, and um, so forth. So it's really hard for me to see much uh, in, uh, in, in Marx's analysis of socialism, aside from his great confidence that the commodity, the capitalist commodity production would be transcended, especially in its class and exploitative character. Uh, it would be transcended by a political movement centered in the proletariat. Um, but the form of organization of production thereafter would be somehow more political than economic. Um, let me quickly uh, then uh, review some other some other things and then try to get on to the discussion part. Um, a really interesting episode is the uh, is this Italian collectivist uh, approach to socialism in the works of Barone and Pareto. And Nico Barone and Pareto, Pareto uh, who were Italians. Um, in later years, Pareto turned out to be a fascist sympathizer, but he's an interesting link between uh, the collectivist vision of solving uh, capitalist production contradictions and the left wing ones. But Pareto and Barone both had the idea that you could. Uh, deal with this in a completely technocratic way. So they said to themselves, well, suppose uh, the Baroni's article, famous article, is called The Ministry of Production in the Socialist um, State. And uh, so he says, well, suppose I was the Ministry of, Pro Ministry of Production, so I get, to, and it's socialism, so I get to tell everybody what to do. What do I, how do I organize production? <coughs> and here's what they came up with. They said, we should run production exactly to make it come out as the ideal of capitalist market allocation of resources. Should equalize marginal costs to marginal utilities across the whole system, marginal benefit to marginal cost. Um, and that's what we should do. That's really what socialism would be. In fact, it would be much better than capitalism because real capitalism can never do that. It's only ideal capitalism that does, that does that. This is a point that somehow drifted out of the consciousness of the economists uh, since that time. And we now say in Chicago economics have the idea that real capitalism does exactly do that. But think about the logic, the dialectical logic of this. Um, so you're trying to find a set of prices, including wages, interest rates, and rents, at which individual enterprise marginal costs will faithfully represent the old social marginal costs. Cost min minimizing production at such prices is socially efficient, which we now call Pareto optimal or Pareto efficient in honor of Pareto. In principle, goods ought to be allocated to households or individuals to equalize these social prices to marginal rates of substitution. Simplest way to do that would be to just give everybody some money income and let them spend it to maximize their own utility. Okay? Well, now this is a picture of socialism, which again somehow looks an awful lot like capitalism, or at least in some dimensions looks an awful lot like capitalism. In this setting, as Paul Samuelson later observed, it really doesn't matter whether capital hires labor or labor hires capital. I mean, you can get, as long as you get this equalization of the <coughs> marginal valuations and costs of the goods, that's the only thing that matters. And whether it's the workers that do that or the capitalists do that or whoever does it doesn't really matter, or state managers. Um, Marx's social relations of production don't seem to matter from this point of view. Except for the distribution of income, socialism and competitive capitalism boil down to the same principles of allocation, according to Brownie and Prego. And this is tremendously influential in modern uh, mainstream economics. This is the bedrock of modern mainstream economics. It's exactly this point of view. And it's what 
it's, it's the way in which the economists, as it were, shrive themselves or um, forgive themselves and say that they're not, they're not really ideological and they're not taking sides because this is what Milton Friedman calls the positive part of economics, which is not ideological. It would be the same in a social society as it is in a capitalist society. Um, the only value-laden issue is who gets the income, is the distribution of income. Um, okay, let me just say a couple of words about the Soviet Union, and then uh, we can turn to uh, maybe some discussion of all of this. Um, it's interesting that exactly uh, at the time that all this, that there was a certain amount of theoretical interest in socialism, of course history is busy doing its own thing, and in this case what it was doing was the Russian Revolution and establishing the Soviet Union as a kind which saw itself in part as an experimental uh, experiment in socialism. Um, there were two big problems the Bolsheviks confronted in the 1920s. Perhaps the less serious problem was actually the organization of day-to-day -day production. That they had a variety of ways of coping with, uh, which we'll talk about uh, in, uh, I'll mention in just a moment. But the bigger one, though, no, was, and it's very interesting from the point of view of the 20th century as a whole, was what we now call the problem of development. That is, it wasn't how did you allocate resources or how, how would you, or, you know, make production happen. It was how do you transform the backward, largely traditional agricultural economy of, sprawling, of the sprawling Russian Empire into a viable industrialized power. And the reason that you wanted to do that was because you knew you were going to lose the next war if you did. Because you lost the last war. So that was... Priority uh, number one. Um, the Soviets arrived at a practical solution to the problem of organization of day-to-day -day production fairly soon after consolidating political power through the Civil War uh, in, with the whites, which would, took the form of what they called the New Economic Policy, or NEP. Now, if you're interested, I think that the NEP is an immensely important thing to understand and probably is to some considerable degree understudied historically and theoretically. <coughs> For example, the NEP is really the Chinese system. It's what the Chinese adopt. It's the Deng Xiaoping system. And uh, you might want to uh, Look at Isabella Weber's Cambridge University PhD thesis on the Chinese reforms, because she approaches the Chinese reforms from the point of view of how did communists come up, Marxist communists come up with this idea, and tries to establish the links to the Russian experience and the NEP in the whole Marxist <coughs> debate. The idea of the NEP was that you were going to actually use socialist control, uh, political control, to foster a substantial capitalist sector that would work according to ordinary commodity production rules. And it worked pretty well. Um, even people like Lenin were willing to accept the NEP framework um, as a pretty much indefinitely prolonged phase of building socialism. Um, Lenin would make exceptions by saying, well, the state should hold the commanding heights of the economy through control of energy, transportation, heavy industry, and finance, but as far as actual day-to-day -day production, clothes, food, all that kind of stuff, maybe you're better off just letting that be, those be ordinary commodities. Um, why didn't the NEP last? Well, first of all, there was this overwhelming pressure of development. And NEP um, had a bias towards agriculture. And as a result of the bias towards agriculture, it tended to foster higher prices for agricultural commodities and higher incomes for agriculture. And this made it 
much more difficult to mobilize agricultural surpluses to industrialize and urbanize uh, the country. So that was one contradiction that uh, struck. And the other was that, in, as you would expect, there, the NEP created a wealthy proto-bourgeoisie. A lot of people made a lot of money out of it, just like the Chinese experience. Uh, we can see in the Chinese experience, and in particular, even some agricultural um, entrepreneurs made a lot of money. Um, that created a threat, what the communists, the Bolsheviks saw as a threat to their political monopoly. And uh, that was another um, uh, motive in the destruction of any um, okay, and let me, let me just do a little bit on the socialist calculation debate and then, and I'll, then I'll stop. Um, so while the Bolshevik um, experiment was going on, um, academics were not, academic philosophy and economics was not sleeping. Um, there were plenty of people who wanted to poke their noses into this whole debate. Um, especially what's now called the Austrian School, which is a version of neoclassical economics. It's interesting that when Rubin uh, does his outline in neoclassical economics, he calls it the Austrian School. Although now the Austrians view themselves as heterodox economists, because they're too far on the right, I guess, or something. Anyway. Um, The idea of the Austrian school was that there are universal economic laws. Now, when you look at these universal economic laws, they look pretty much what, like what Marx called the laws of commodity production and monetary exchange. Um, and they had to do with equalization of the rate of profit and equalization of the margin of uh, the values of uh, different uh, use of commodities. Uh, the father of all this, a guy named Ludwig von Mises, was moved to argue that centrally planned socialism was an impossibility. This is a great, I, I love this great thing. It's impossible. Well, there he is sitting there in the Soviet Union right there, going along day by day, and he wrote this in the 1930s, and it, the, the Soviet Union managed to stagger along for another 50 years. So the idea that it was an impossibility seems a little strange. And von Mises' reason for arguing that it was impossible is quite interesting. Um, he said that economic rationality required determining market clearing prices for millions of specific goods and services that are produced by a modern economy, which is exactly these equalizations of marginal cost and marginal utility and marginal rates of substitution and marginal utility. And he argued that was beyond the capacity of entry, any central planning mechanism on computational grounds. It was beyond human um, capabilities to, to do that. You could only do that through markets and some kind of decentralized, a spontaneous thing where no one person or no one group of people were going to be in control. Um, it's curious to me that when, just exactly when von Mises started to write this, who else is working? Alan Turing is working. And what is Alan Turing working on? Alan Turing is working on the theory and the actual construction of digital computers, which actually offer, I mean, in some level, to um, solve von Mises' problem since maybe with, a, with huge amounts of computing capacity, you could actually come pretty close to solving all of these issues. Um, th this became very important for the history of economics, of regular economics, mainstream economics. Oscar Blanga and Abba Lerner, a learner I think taught at the New School um, for a, a while, um, and is the father of what we, what's now modern monetary theory, the movement called modern monetary theory, 
that. Uh, cleverly, maybe they were, uh, Abelardi was the kind of person who was very likely to outsmart himself in life. He was so clever that he could find himself on the wrong end of the argument in the end. Um, turned uh, von Mises's argument on its head. Why couldn't a socialist society, along the lines of Baroni's analysis, mimic a capitalist commodity a, uh, economy by instructing the socialist managers of enterprises to compete on markets like capitalist firms, said uh, Lerner and Lama. But this turned out to be a very perilous move because it endorsed the idea that the comparison of socialism and capitalism could legitimately be reduced purely to a comparison of the allocation of resources and these marginal equalities and Pareto efficiency and that, and that whole logic. This was immensely, I mean, that's when the door opened to post-World War II mainstream economics because they saw that as allowing them to charge ahead with a bunch of equations and models and stuff like that um, without having to answer for any of the politics of it. So, uh, just as a final postscript to that, it turned out that uh, Hayek, Friedrich Hayek, um, and I'm, many people don't like me like me by saying this. I just got a referee's report uh, yesterday on this paper. And the referee said, oh, it's a great paper, except all wrong about Hayek. Hayek completely not as good as what Foley says. He didn't know who I was, so. Um, as the author says. Um, Hayek, when he thought this through, said, well, you know, Mises is sort of on the right track, but it's not really the problem. The real problem is much more existential than that. The problem is that the socialist uh, managers could not mimic capitalist enterprises because they wouldn't have any skin in them. You got it, that the whole process of, and, and then from this point of view, if this is Hayek's version of what I call Adam's fallacy, or the idea that commodity production is in fact human life. He says, well, the, um, the only way that human life works is that the people have to, it's like um, Proteus. I, I don't know if you know the myth of Proteus, but Proteus was a, a demigod who could tell the future. So heroes and stuff were really interested in getting Proteus to tell them what was going to happen when they went to war with the Indian lions and stuff like that. And Proteus uh, normally had the form of an old man who was asleep on a beach. But he hated to tell the future. So if he realized he was coming to try to get him to tell the future, he would trans he could transform himself into anything. Huge ball of fire, scary lion, dragon, you know, something really terrible. This is why we call that kind of transformation protean, P-R-O-T-E-A-N, it's proteus from proteus. So you had to got, sneak up on him when he was asleep, tie him up so he couldn't change, and then he will only tell you the future to get on top. So Hayek's idea is that we're all kind of protean figures. None, of, we all have a little bit of knowledge uh, about social production, but we won't give it up unless we're absolutely forced to. And the way we get forced to is that the market makes us do it. Um, so for Hayek, uh, the change, there was a significant change from focusing on allocation and the Pareto Barone story to focusing on this existential situation of human beings uh, sharing information in society. Okay, so I think that covers thank, some of the material. Thank you very much uh, for a wonderful paper and, uh, and presentation. I will uh, restrict myself to ba maybe just two uh, uh, points, uh, uh, very simple, and I think uh, 
one has to do with something you already included, and some, and the other has to do with something that you, uh, I think, uh, uh, leave out from this pre magisterial presentation of this of this history. So, so first, the thing that you had, so you very well indicate uh, the the reluctance uh, of of Marx. And you see this in other writers too, whether Kautsky, Luxembourg, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, especially you see it in the Social Democrats. Uh, the reluctance to actually try to spell out what the socialist future uh, would be. And this is even after Marx uh, himself did some things in that direction. Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, there's a good argument for that, but as you say, the argument uh, doesn't really work so well now uh, because of these experiments that have already taken place and the fact that socialism as an idea is in at least political trouble, even if its economics still has strength. So Marx himself did try to overcome this by occasional remarks, and it is not just the Gotha program, but uh, one could almost write a a book, and I'm sure this has been done by a lot of people, selecting the passages from Grundrisse, uh, Theories of Surplus Value, Three Volumes of Capital, not to speak of earlier works, where uh, some dimension of this problem is, is discussed. And I think uh, uh, this, this is now part of the heritage, is that on the one side uh, uh, there are ideas, and these ideas uh, appear, the ones that Marx actually spelled out, appear canonical, and yet there is no organizational model within which they could be fit. So we really don't know the answers to lots of questions, for example, even the Critique of Gotha program. Uh, yes, the class replaces the class, uh, but, but who speaks for it, and how, and what organizational structures, right? Because socialists have discussed this over and over again, but Marx does not say say much. Uh, and so then it becomes uh, a, a serious question whether it is okay for a uh, unique party or uh, a statist elite. Uh, and uh, and well, obviously Barona and uh, Pareto think it's okay to do it uh, do it that way. So, so re real troubles are, are left to the, uh, left to the uh, future not only because Marx didn't go into it, but also because he went into some principles on the one side. For example, the stress on labor values, uh, labor time, which you mentioned, uh, which seems to indicate, I think if I read you correctly, that the Ricardian socialists are wrong only because they think you could have these labor certificates uh, in a market system under capitalism, but Perhaps under socialism, the implication is, I think the text is from the, um, I'm not even sure now which Marx text you refer to, but doesn't matter. Uh, the implication is that once you do have uh, uh, something like central planning, uh, then this, this would be the basis. And this is a very serious problem for the future, because no one ever knew how to calculate in labor time. Right? I mean, you're the economist, not me. But can't be done because of the variety of labors. Uh, even under socialism, there remain there's a variety of labors. So, uh, so how do you convert uh, uh, the new school uh, uh, guard downstairs and you and me? Uh, what kind of skill would we be using uh, uh, to determine uh, what our certificate after ten hours of work should say each day? Should it say the same? Should it say something different? What is the conversion? What is the basis? And this is, an, this is a problem for the future because Marx seems to be committed to it in some way. Okay, so that's the first question uh, that in a way uh, uh, is, uh, is much, uh, it's a question of, of Marxology to some extent because after all socialism in the 20th century tries to deal with many of these questions in a lot of ways and perhaps you don't have to worry about it too much but I, I would still maintain that the Marxist assumptions and the fact that he combines some principles with uh, uh, the absence of organizational uh, 
tools uh, creates problem uh, problem for the future. Uh, then the question about the omission. I, I must say I don't buy the Turing uh, uh, argument against von Mises. I mean, the Soviet Union already in the 1950s, 60s could have whatever computers that it wished to have. Uh, the planning apparatus is in place. So why does the thing produce even greater disaster in terms of allocations then than it does uh, in the 1930s? Because in the 1930s, they industrialized this place. Uh, the horrors, of course, are undeniable, but, but in a way they accomplished the task uh, from the 1950s, 60s on. When the computers are there, they don't accomplish it. In fact, they fall behind further and further and further. So, so, I'm, so this are, I don't buy the argument. And the reason, I th the question uh, that I wanted to raise is that perhaps this has to do with some omissions on your part. Uh, now, I'm not an economist, and so I can't really now uh, uh, argue what, what high exposition was. Uh, and of course it is now filtered through many writers subsequently, but I think it is not only a question of coordination, it's also a question of information. I think his point always, had, always was and had to be, we'll reread him to check, that, it is, uh, uh, that the market in a way performs two functions. One gains information about, about needs, that it does so, the capitalist market in terms of effective demand, and it also coordinates then uh, the decisions of the producer. So it's, it has a double function. And what the Turing computer idea addresses is only the second of these, not the information problem. And I think the information problem would be very tough to solve uh, without a market, although people have advanced various democratic options uh, uh, for substituting for a market in that case. I'm not so sure, not convinced, uh, convinced uh, that that they would work. And the second omission, which is only a partial one for you, is, is that of property. Because it's, 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 it's one thing, of course, uh, to just focus on the capitalist, or rather the, the, uh, the Soviet manager, uh, who presumably has no property, uh, and therefore has no reason to follow what, uh, what Lange and what uh, of a learner and Bruce and all the market socialists would have uh, claimed would be desirable is to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, make uh, efficient and economic choices about prices and uh, investment decisions. They have no personal stake, you said, and so they can be relied on. But it is not only them who have no personal stake, the workers also have no personal stake. And indeed, uh, uh, the various levels of the bureaucracy also have no personal stake. So the tendency of such a system is for no one to care about those matters, not just the single manager, but the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the constituency. And this has been pointed out by lots of people, is a fundamental lack that the property question is not solved. Now, the answer to this is not automatically capitalist property, but real property of some kind. And I think if you mentioned, you mentioned the NEP, or you mentioned China, uh, part of the solution is not just restoring the market, but also restoring property. And the NEP has three forms of property, right? It has state ownership, it has uh, uh, collective ownership by cooperatives, it has individual small-scale ownership by peasants. China now, you probably would add also municipal forms of ownership. Uh, now, these, uh, some of them are capitalist forms of property, but not all of them. And I would say that that would be an important addition to your very excellent presentation, that uh, 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 what, what the tradition doesn't solve uh, uh, without the market is the information problem, and what the tradition does not solve uh, uh, on the basis of motivations, uh, in terms of motivations, is the property problem. And I think that those two uh, also, also matter. And of course, going back to my first point, uh, Marx leaves off these puzzles because, because he assumes a system of no real property. State is not a real owner, uh, right? And he assumes uh, uh, also uh, that uh, 
well, what's my, uh, the second, no, I'm forgetting the second half of what I wanted to say. Okay, so I'll stop at this point. I just have one yeah. little footnote then that uh, could open up. Um, there is a position that the problem the Soviets hit in the 50s and 60s was not just coordination, it was the fact that in the 30s they were operating a labor surplus economy in Lewis terms. And by the 50s and 60s, labor was starting to become actually yes. scarce in the Soviet This is the and intensive, their, extensive problem. And, their, you know, and the and shift their, from extensive growth to intensive development cannot be. But that would be a very serious objection against the model because it is only good to industrialize a country which is not industrialized in the first place. Right? And it is no good to deal with the problems of a capitalist, a developed capitalist country. And that would be a very serious objection against Marx, if it were true. And it's a serious objection against the model in the Soviet Union and China. And they learn from it by going to NEP. That's what you said. I completely agree with Deng Xiaoping and NEP analogy. But going to that, from a classical Marxian point of view, is backwards. Lenin even called it a retreat, right? It's a retreat, a temporary retreat we must carry out. Then he perhaps didn't think it was temporary, but that's what Trotsky is. Trotskyism always assumed that it is temporary. Priobrzezhensky is just as much an enemy of it as Stalin. Okay, but anyhow, uh, I think that's probably the explanation, right? But it's, a, it's an objection against the tradition because it, sh it, it should work for Germany and England and the United States. Not just not for underdeveloped Russia and China. Problems of Hayekism, I, and I think you you raised the key point that this very piece that you said. Well, look, it means that nobody. It, there's no rationality, so there's no real discussion of what we think of as political economy. There's only a discussion of procedure and process. And everything is piecemeal and local, and that's the most you can do. And however it comes out, globally you can't say anything about it because as long as locally it was legitimate or whatever it was, then that's, that's its own legitimation. I think the weakness of this, which we, is, and it's a weakness of liberalism in general, is that it cannot consolidate itself as a political uh, method of governing the society. It always fails. The, the liberals in the, eight, the 19th century liberals were never, even though they made an attempt to have parties and everything like that, never could consolidate a hegemonic or even dominant uh, political role. And I think we're seeing the same thing with neoliberalism. And I tend to, my view is the problem with Hayekian neoliberalism is that it drifts over into more right-wing and more um, authoritarian, authoritarian uh, <clears throat> politics. Partly because the authoritarians supply the rationality, the global rationality, it may be very defective that the, that the Hayekian vision just can't deliver. Well, Pareto's own history is very instructive in this way because you would think Pareto would be a John Stuart Mill liberal, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that would, in some way, but he isn't. He realizes, I think, along the lines of the points that you were making, that that the uh, that you're going to have to have a strong state. Um, my colleague Claire Maté is writing a book, a very interesting book, which includes a review of Italian. Uh, politics in the 1920s at the beginning of the fascist, of, of the fascist uh, regime. And it turned out that Pareto, although he was a very senior person at that time, was pretty sympathetic to the fascists. Um, probably on the grounds, very much like these, that, well, you just can't trust people to pursue their self-interest the way that 
liberal economics. You, you, you're going to have to have the state enforce their self-interest. So that, that would be my rough answer to your, to your, first, to your first question. And, and I do think if you look, I mean, okay, one more thing to say about that. The difference between the Montpelerin Society and John Stuart Mill is that the Montpelerin Society gave up the idea of no state intervention, of the watchman state or whatever you, night watchman state. And they accepted, and this is why they've had such political influence, they accepted the idea that you're going to have a strong state. You just want it to be deployed in the interests of this particular view of political economy that they had. Um, so I think that's an important point. Now, the, the, the second question is from Is liberalism or liberalism, is it, can we distinguish Oh, liberalism? economic, well, see, in order to really have a good discussion of that question, I would have to understand better what content you put in the words political liberalism and economic liberalism um, than I do right now. So, um, but I think, in a way, your question reflects exactly what I was trying to say, that the dilemma of liberalism is not that it, it doesn't make sense logically, it just doesn't work very well politically. Well, I, would, I tend to think that that's where Marx has a pretty good uh, story to tell. Marx says uh, capitalism is commodity production mediated by uh, mon monetary exchange in which the means of production are appropriated by a class, the capitalist class, and in which the dominant form of labor is wage labor. <coughs> and, there, and it's out of wage labor that he uh, analyzes the uh, production of surplus value, which is what keeps the whole thing uh, keeps the whole thing going. So I would say that's. I mean, commodity production includes some decentralization. The class element is very important, and the wage labor. Element. Well, of course, you know, real history is all about the word lines, isn't it? I mean, I would assume that the, what's behind your question is some notion of, okay, what is China? What is the Chinese system? Right. Is it a version of, of Marxist socialism or is it a, a version, it's just a globalized capitalism? I, I think that's a very good thing to think about. I don't think it has any very obvious and reductive answer to it. It's, it's, I think also it's a great question because it raises issues, contemporary ones, not just China, which is probably the most interesting, but the literature on varieties of capitalism, which actually shows how different <coughs> capitalist countries can be from one another. So do they step over the threshold? But even theoretically in your paper, now I, I can't really, I don't have a photographic memory anymore, I don't really re remember, there are certain things which you said would be capitalist. And I think that they raise, it. maybe that's why you were even raised your question. And they raise a threshold problem for me. For example, let's assume, uh, which never existed anywhere, not Yugoslavia even, right, which very much a kind of uh, uh, project, namely generalized workers' control in the context of markets, right? That would raise the threshold question more seriously than even China now, right? Because it would involve uh, uh, no longer expropriation of surplus value by private owners, but you could say, and I think you might have used the term in, the, in your lecture, or maybe it's in the paper, I'm not even sure, self-exploitation. You could call it self-exploitation. The workers' cooperative exploits itself because, of course, it does have to save, take something out from the uh, labor uh, time for uh, collective consumption, uh, for uh, uh, for uh, uh, accumulation, uh, and even uh, somebody has to take out uh, for the welfare services. I'm sure in Yugoslavia this was constantly done through the taxes. So there is surplus value being expropriated, but not by private <coughs> capitalists. Now, I'm not calling this an ideal system, and certainly Yugoslavia, which we'll try to cover in this class at some point, uh, 
uh, had a lot of problems even when the system was tried. But the threshold question that I'm sorry you, you, that she so very well asked would be raised for that. Would be raised for that, and we have to worry about it because we we are are we imagining. Uh, a condition under which all the threshold questions are solved in a way that Marx would have solved them? Or are we ready to entertain, like I think a mixed form of, a system of mixed property is better than either state ownership or private ownership. Uh, but would that be capitalist? And, and, and if you call it capitalist, is that a problem? And I think these threshold questions are all going to be with us, uh, as uh, the question also indicated. Um, in, there's a companion paper to this one, uh, which is the one from Vienna to Santa Fe. We'll distribute and in, Yes, uh, because it does address some of these questions explicitly. For example, it discusses the workers' control uh, uh, question more explicitly, and it actually tries to put forward my own utopian model of how you might have decentralized division of labor with, without commodity exchange. Right. Well, you know, um, if, if you might want to take a course on economic development theory um, because it turns out that that basic pattern of Transformation. This is in the this is in the work, especially one uh, path uh, seminal work on this is Arthur Lewis's analysis of the dual dual economy and the labor surplus economy. But one way of looking at economic development is that it, it whether it's taking place under capitalist or socialist political forms, it always has that pattern. I mean, except in Denmark, I think. The exception what's that the, I know. What's the pattern again? The pattern is exploitation of the of a declining agricultural sector. Uh, you got an agricultural right. sector that is overswollen with right. Right. population and labor, and you're trying to move people out of that and into urban industrial employment. That's pre obrazhensky's primitive socialist. Exactly. Economy. Yes, that's one version of it. Yeah. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And it's Marx's primitive accumulation. And, and Marx's it, primitive accumulation. And so this pattern is not very specific to either a socialist or a capitalist. I mean, the U.S. went through exactly the same thing in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century. There was a, a huge decline of the agricultural sector and a huge shift of surplus from the agricultural sector to the nascent to industrial sector. So it's it's not it's not that's that's somewhat across like orthogonal to the socialism, capitalism question. Sometimes you might want to look a little bit at the economic history of the post-Civil War United States and the difficulties there were in mobilizing, especially Afro-American sharecropping labor into the industrial sector. Um, I'm not, if they didn't have the hoo system, maybe Grover Cleveland would have liked to know about the hoo system or something, but uh, they did have, I mean, if you think that there was free mobility of labor in Alabama and Mississippi in the 1880s and 1890s, no. no. I, I don't think, I mean, now I, I don't know a whole lot, of, as, as much as I would like to, about Marx's intellectual and personal biography. And I don't think anybody really does, because although there are very uh, source, good sor some good sources, I don't think they've by any means all been uh, really used effectively biographically. The best one that I know is by this guy Sperber, I think, uh, I thought was an attempt. Um, and, the, and Marx's life and his work is so politicized and so ideologically uh, contentious that it's practically impossible to, for us to get any balanced or uh, perspective of view on. I don't think Marx was interested in that question, really. 
he was, I think yeah. maybe Engels was a little more interested in the peasant question, but I don't think Marx was. If you read what he had to say about Irish labor in the, and, and the, he understood where the proletariat was coming from. He understood that the proletariat were transformed peasant class. He could see that in Germany, which is what, what he, I think he always took as his uh, main uh, reference point for that kind of thinking. So I, I, I'm not sure that he would have particularly um, held out for slowing down the decline of the peasant agricultural uh, economy. But even without that, and I think this is obviously the peasant question is an Achilles heel of the tradition, which then uh, Lenin and Mao uh, are the ones who in some ways uh, figure out how to deal with that. Uh, or, or I would put it, we're left holding the bag. Left holding the bag. Okay. But of course, they can't avoid it because for reasons <coughs> that now Lenin and Trotsky see, uh, the revolutionary option migrates from the West uh, to, uh, to the East. And so they have to deal with peasants because that's what they have. And they, get, they have holding the bag. And of course, uh, you don't want to blame them for Stalin. But on some level, there is even there a line. I mean, one. Uh, can show that pre obrazhensky's solution of, of primitive accumulation, primitive socialist accumulation through just taxes and prices was not going to work. So what was going to work if you weren't going to do it? But I think that, uh, that since we should proceed imminently, uh, uh, your presentation shows a different Achilles heel, which we have not stressed, and that's between the political and the economic dimension. Okay. And that is, I think, uh, in your paper, the major thing that, that I was very impressed by, uh, how openly and how well you express it. Uh, but in any case, it, it then leads to, to, to serious problems, because let's assume that, that Marxist economics, even though it's been challenged, uh, is, it is still the best way to look at what capitalism is, and at least to reconstruct some of its tendencies uh, which uh, he reconstructed in the first uh, to really do, but that's fine. But what if the political problem that you describe, which is a double one, is that however well he explained his development, it does not spontaneously produce socialism. So Kautsky and those who expected that are wrong. And on the other side, uh, 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 also, industrial workers. You said this, and I, we, we did a lot of work on Proudhon in this uh, in this group, uh, who actually kind of knew what workers were like a little better uh, through his personal life and so on. Uh, industrial workers are attracted by different ideas. You put it so well, uh, they don't want to control it; they want to share it, right? Uh, in other words. Uh, 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 share in it uh, could mean two things. A, share part of the, uh, the benefits, economic benefits, but share also uh, management on a lower level. That's what really workers are. Anarcho-syndicalists by the nature, that's what you're telling me in this paper. They're not Marxists. Sometimes they become Marxists, join Marxist movements, but they're really anarcho-syndicalists. And if that is the case, uh, isn't this uh, uh, a much bigger problem for the tradition than people have recognized. And because you know you, your paper kind of raises this in the beginning, then you talk about other things. I'm not entirely sure how big a problem you take this to be, but it is a it is a huge problem. Oh, I think it's a decisive problem for Marx's actual personal program. Uh, right. He, I mean, the proletarian revolutionary program never. Not That's anymore. not really what happened in the 20th century. Parts of it happened, but not, but not the way uh, Marx. Uh, yeah, after the First World War, war, parts of it almost happened. They tried. People tried. tried. They could happen. But uh, it didn't happen largely, I think, because of the contradictions <coughs> that you. But even there, the yeah. I would say they were more Proudhonian because it's a kind of conciliar movement everywhere of workers who want to take over their firms. They're not fighting. I completely follow you in this. Uh, they're not fighting for centralized control over the whole setup. They are trying to set up workers' collective that control their own workplace. And that's true in Germany, that's true in, uh, in Italy, and I think it was true in, in Russia too between February and October. 
It was true even there. Remember in October, it's not a real well, October it changed. It, window, it, is it? It but changes, right? <laughs> that's the... But, but that's, you know, a really serious problem. I mean, not just a serious problem. It's even a problem, I would think, and this would be something that we can't really figure out now, is this a problem then even for the economics on some level? Well, sure. And uh, let me... Um, if you're interested in that, if any of you are writing theses or stuff like that and want to get into the political economy of this, you might want to look at a part of Sam Bowles's book, Microeconomics. Um, in the, I think it's chapter 12 or 13, he raises the question of would the worker prefer to stay a worker or would the worker prefer to own the firm? Okay, and this is the kind of question that Bowles has the analytical has analytical tools which are not perfect or complete or anything, but at least it gives him some leverage over this. It turns out uh, that the answer to it has to do with risk. Because with if the worker is going to take over the firm, the worker is going to take over certain risks that are involved that uh, offset the fact that the worker no longer has to uh, pay the, uh, uh, you know, has to be exploited. So if you're interested in this, there, there are ways to try to get some leverage on, on this. And uh, is it good question. for the other workers who are not part of the firm that these workers took over the firm with respect to uh, hiring more who were previously not well employed or didn't like their job? Would workers who control the firm want to share ownership with larger and larger number of in people. The, in the second paper, I go through the, I summarized. It actually the economic analysis of workers' control was very well uh, developed yes. in the 1970s, yes. uh, especially by a, a guy named Yaroslav Vanyak and uh, it's a famous a yes. series of. Uh, he was part of a group of people who really did this very seriously, and it's clear that one of the problem macro problems of workers control is it has a bias against employment. Right. Because the workers who control the firm don't want to hire enough up to the marginal product right. because it dilutes their share of the uh, surplus of the firm. Um, and maybe bias against long-term accumulation. Well, that doesn't seem to be as true. Right. I mean, the, actually, in this same Bowles book, there's a chapter on workers' control which um, summarizes some of the work. A guy named John Pencavill, who was a Stanford professor, uh, systematically did a huge amount of work on workers' control of firms, in, especially in the United States. You may not realize it, but workers' control has been a significant, although not a dominant, sector of the U.S. economy for forever, really. And it doesn't show much signs of either growing or shrinking. So it seems to be pretty stable. Well, that's one circumstance historically where workers' control uh, happens. For example, it even happened in West Virginia. There was this steel company in West Virginia under the George W. Bush administration, that where the workers tried to take control to keep the thing uh, going. I mean, you can see where the Rust Belt politics. I mean, there's desperation for you. The, the workers are willing to actually try to take over. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't work. It wasn't a permanent uh, solution. But here's the general point you attribute to Marx is right: is that you want to do these things under a strong capitalist setting with its ideologies. It's one thing if you wanted to do it, but of course Yugoslavia would speak against me here. You wanted to do it under a setting of state ownership, your advantages should be greater. You should be able to do it better. But perhaps not under a single party system. So perhaps Yugoslavia should have been improved in some way for this to be able, politically to be able to work. So both a capitalist system and a Stalinist type, single type party system may not be the ideal settings to give anarcho-syndicalism or workers' control a real chance. Well, now let me make one more <laughs> um, possibly uh, subversive comment about the Yugoslav system. There has to be a relation between the fact that Yugoslavia was this extremely unstable ethnic 
uh, a coalition of different proto-states or actual states and the workers' control form of organization. Yes. Why? Because the workers' control form of, form of organization allowed the Slovenian firms, let's say, which were extremely um, and profitable and the northern Croatian firms, it, it allowed them to keep their surpluses without pressure to uh, transfer all so of the money redistribution to, problems to, would be, to southern Serbia right, and Kosovo right, and stuff. So, right, right. Um, I mean, there, these things are all connected. Right? <laughs> Anybody else? Well, thank you very much. It was wonderful. Yeah. It's really great to have you.